In discussing cultural differences and expectations, I find more education is needed here because we're not raised with that cultural background about Japanese ideals.、Uh, these aren't Canadian ideals or North American ideals, and they aren't part of the natural fiber of our socialization and upbringing here in North America. In large federations, you need a system to organize your teachers and your students, and a hierarchy to maintain control. So, ranking is a logistical necessity. Is it a good thing? Well, I would rather consider it a necessity. Whether it is a good thing or or bad thing depends on how the people involved use it. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Tokushikai Inside Look podcast. Today, we're speaking once again with Douglas Tong Sensei from Orangeville, Canada. As we continue our exploration into Japanese culture in Budo, part two of this series will focus on the concept of rank and where it fits within Japanese martial arts and the broader society. In the stimulating lecture, he shares insights from his sensei as well as personal experience and knowledge from a lifetime in education, including a graduate degree and a career that spans almost three decades. So, without further ado, I give you Douglas Kong Sensei on the concept of rank. Maybe a, a good way to start is it's about relationships, and you mentioned hierarchy as well, and that's all kind of connected. And it's about how you relate to people, and that again, if you want to go back in time and history, goes back to Con- Confucian philosophy. Everybody has a certain place in society, and how they interact. You know, what level are you at? Is a societal construct as well, right? But first off, l- let's get to your question, which was about rank. So. And I guess if we take it from the level of the organization, we kind of need to define that. If we're talking about an individual dojo, which is a small organization, rank on this smaller scale helps to define everyone, their relationship to everyone else there, and their level of progress and accomplishment in the art. In some situations, it defines whether a person can teach that art. In your art of Iaido, for instance, reaching a certain rank gives a person the authority to teach. Now, whether this person has the knowledge and the skill to teach once they reach that rank is another matter, and we can discuss it at another time. And why do I say this? Because teaching is its own separate art form. You may have all the knowledge in the world, but not be able to teach it. And I've heard this, especially when I was at university, and you had some professors who knew the subject matter really well, but could not teach it at all. And that's because teaching is the art of reaching students, not just transmitting content. Right. Anyways, to get back to the topic, if we're talking about a larger organization like an association or a federation, these kinds of large bodies need a ranking structure to keep track of everyone. You know, because there's there's just too many people. It's an operational necessity. In large federations, you need a system to organize your teachers and your students. And a hierarchy to maintain control. So ranking is a logistical necessity. In this situation, rank then becomes very important for this large kind of organization to continue to survive. It needs a system to promote people, particularly particularly into the teaching ranks, so that they can teach the people coming in, like a big machine. This perpetuates the system. So people will leave the system. You know, naturally they pass on. Some will drop out, and so on. And new people will come into the system. So someone needs to educate the new people coming in. Is it a good thing? Well, I would rather consider it a necessity. Whether it is a good thing or or bad thing depends on how the people involved use it. A ranking system also allows the breaking up of the curriculum into pieces, or levels, or sections. To make the learning of the curriculum easier,、uh, breaking it down into digestible chunks that the students can handle, because I guess、uh, a big, you know,、uh, an entire curriculum is just too overwhelming. There's just too many things in it. Like, I don't know how many katas there are in your art of Iaido. Eighty, ninety? I, I have no idea. Yeah, there's a lot, right? And people just can't handle that kind of volume. So, in this way, breaking it down it makes it. More easily digestible, I guess. Yeah. It also gives the students、uh, clearly defined goals to achieve and to strive for. It basically answers the question: What is the student supposed to be learning at a certain level? So, in this way, it's a logical structure. Now, as regards the people, how does rank affect individual people? Well, 
on a positive note, it is a clearly defined system. You know exactly what you have to do to achieve the next rank. It gives the students a yardstick by which they can measure their own progress. So they know how they have done, how they are doing currently, and what they need to do to keep progressing. So it's like a measuring stick. The students feel a sense of accomplishment and can clearly see a roadmap for learning. Okay, so that keeps them motivated as well and engaged. So having a ranking system also necessitates that you have a testing structure in place. To get to the next rank, you need to undergo a, a test of some kind. And in big organizations, these, texts, these tests take on a standardized nature so that each student does the same test and this ensures consistency. Right? So here we see the necessity for a set of agreed upon standards for proficiency at a certain level in the art. On the surface, these kinds of standardized tests also give the impression that there is an objective measure. This in theory allows equal opportunity for all students for advancement without bias or favoritism. In theory, it sounds sensible and fair. A standardized test will look at your technical ability, whether you can perform what is required. It will also look at your knowledge of concepts and principles. These are things that can be quantified and measured objectively. So in theory, a student from Vancouver is just as able to pass the test as a student from Toronto or Montreal. So for many people, this is a good thing. It creates a level playing field. Now, that having been said, rank does also present a danger. The more rank that is involved, the more danger of people developing a sense of and becoming dominated by their ego and pride. This is not due to the system itself, but how the people involved use or abuse the system. Now, I don't want to focus on negative things, but I've heard that the rank system can sometimes, sometimes bring with it a whole host of issues involving things like hierarchy, power politics, exclusion, ambition, ladder climbing, a clan mentality sometimes, and the formation of cliques, the evolution of a caste-like atmosphere, other things like backstabbing and other typical kind of social issues we see in large organizations and corporations. Now, in this kind of scenario, it is not good for the individuals involved, nor is it good for the organization as a whole, as there is no cohesion or unity. Like any corporate organization, it can become very dysfunctional and it can hurt the people who are involved. And this is when focus on the art comes to be forgotten. The people are too busy climbing the ladder or all their energy is wasted on keeping track of everyone else and all the gossip and things like that. So in some cases, they view learning the art merely as an act of learning only what they need to in order to pass the test so that they can reach the next rank or level. But that is when the beauty of the art gets forgotten. It becomes a purely a technical exercise. I suppose it is kind of like how some people approach uh, post-secondary studies. You can approach it from a love of learning perspective where you're interested in learning more about that field, or you can view it in more utilitarian ways as a means to an end, which is to get a job. They don't really care that much about the subject they are studying. They care only about what it can get them, which is namely a job, which equates to money and status. So these are some ways in which having a ranking system cannot have so positive results. But it depends on the person, again, and the people involved. The ranking system itself is not at fault. It is just a system. It's how people view the system and interpret the system and use the system for their own purposes. Now, this reminds me of a story. My old master, Suguno Sensei, asked me one day if I wanted to test for my shodan, which is the, the first degree black belt, right? I said I wasn't interested, uh, politely, of course. I was young and idealistic, and maybe I should have, but I didn't really care for it, to tell you the truth. It wasn't important to me. And maybe I'm a little bit of a purist, and maybe I'm more old school than I would like to believe. What, is important, uh, what was important to me was learning all about the art. So chasing pieces of paper just didn't interest me. And, but in my old age now, I think maybe I should have. But I don't know. It still doesn't interest me that much. I've always believed that you can tell a guy's level of proficiency when you meet them and look them in the eye, in, like in Kenjutsu when you touch their sword. 
when you come sword to sword. At that moment, no piece of paper can hide that fact. In the ancient times, they studied to survive, you know, to live for the next day. Anyway, I have, I've since wondered what Sugino Sensei uh, might have thought about my answer. Now, I'm sure that there are other f foreign students who would have jumped at the chance to get a rank. I was again offered the opportunity to test for rank in 2008 by his son, but I declined. One of my old students who studied under me for a decade, he did test for rank and he passed easily. Now he's the third down and he's working on his fourth. So I guess that is justification enough. And it kind of tells me everything I need to know about my abilities. And as for myself, I still have no rank in the art. And so I guess I'm still a beginner. This reminds me of another story. You've heard me mention Sugino Sensei. Well, for those who are not aware of who he is, he was a sword fight choreographer for um, director Akito Kurosawa's two most acclaimed films, Seven Samurai and Yojimbo. I'm sure that you've heard of those two movies. Kurosawa wanted the best sword masters to choreograph his movies, and Sugino Sensei was recommended to him. Uh, the other sword master recommended was Sasamori Junzo Sensei the 16th Soke of Onoha Itoryu. But he was tied up with another project at that time, so he couldn't do it. And coincidentally, I studied uh, Onoha Itoryu under his son, Sasamori Takemi Sensei, who was the 17th Soke. Anyway, Sugino Sensei was also the sword fight choreographer for director Hiroshi Inagaki's epic movie, Miyamoto Musashi, which is one of my favorites, and has been retitled The Samurai Trilogy in North America. And that movie won the Academy Award in 1955. It's, it's a fantastic movie. As a matter of fact, uh, Mifune Toshiro, the famous actor in all these legendary movies, was Sugino Sensei's student in Katori Shintoryu. Oh, so here's a story about Mifune Toshiro, just if, if you don't mind me taking an aside. One morning I was sleeping and I got a phone call. Um, it was Pat. He said, Tong, you have to get to the dojo right away. I said, what? because I was half asleep and I was still, you know, rubbing the sleep out of my eyes. You have to come to the dojo. There's a famous person coming in an hour. And I said, who? He said, Mifune Toshiro. Who's that? I asked, because I had, at that time I had no idea who this person was. He's a famous actor. And I said, ah, forget it. I'm going back to bed. You don't want to miss this one. And it was my day off, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was to go to the dojo in Kawasaki, which would take me almost two hours to get there. And it was raining. You know, it's always raining in Japan. Nah, I'll pass. I'll, I'll, I'll come the next time he comes. Well, did I live to regret that? I missed a chance to meet him as he took time out of his busy schedule to come to the Sugino dojo to pay his respects to his old teacher. Pat and another student got their autographs and their pictures taken with with this icon, this legendary actor. And well, sadly he passed away four years later in 1997. So I've kicked myself ever since for missing this opportunity, you know. So what's the lesson to be learned here? You only have one chance sometimes in life, so don't miss it. So like my story, the opportunity may never come again. So, you know, don't be lazy. Anyways. That is crazy. You could have <laughs> met the man himself. Yeah. I could have met the man himself, yeah, oh my God. Yeah, so, you know, and those guys, they, they still um, tease me to this day, uh, show, showing off their pictures. <laughs> oh, boy. I should have I sh I got up and went. Anyways, okay, so back to the story. So there you have a few interesting tidbits of information. And here's a story, actually, that I wanted to tell you about um, Sugino Sensei um, and the issue of rank. So, and, and I wrote it on my website, so I'll kind of read it to you. So, okay, here it goes. One day in the summer of 1992, as Sunday morning class was ending, a group of the European students was getting undressed on the dojo floor. To give a little background, in the summer months in Japan at Sugino Dojo, there would be foreign visitors from other countries who would come to train for a special session and stay for like a month. So usually they were foreign teachers or senior students. They're all black belts usually, pretty skilled and probably pretty highly recognized in their own countries for their achievements in martial arts. And some of them, yes, would come in with some airs and the attitude of being a big shot. They would live at the dojo and sleep at the dojo. On one occasion after Sunday classes, we were all preparing to go for lunch and a beer at the local little restaurant nearby. 
with Suge no Sensei. They were all taking their hakama off. When Suge no Sensei reappeared after taking his hakama off in an adjacent room, he still had his Aikido uniform on, like a white top, a uh, gi top, and white pants. And it was tied with a uh, white belt, like a white karate belt. One of the European black belts, a teacher, I presume, asked Suge no Sensei, Sensei, why do you wear a white belt? He said it in a joking manner, like he was amused. It was translated to an interpreter. I suppose that the man thought that a famous sword master like Suguno Sensei deserved the, the right to wear a black belt, perhaps as a sign of his rank and status in the dojo. I guess maybe he thought that if anyone had the right to wear a black belt, uh, you know, which is a symbol of the highest achievement in martial arts, it would be the legendary Suguno Sensei, uh, famed choreographer of Kurosawa's celebrated samurai classics, Yojimbo and Seven Samurai, and teacher the famous actor Mifune Toshiro. Sugino sensei smiled, nodded his head, pulled on his beard, which he usually did, thought about it, and replied kindly with a smile. He said, mm, because I'm a beginner, because I'm still a beginner. I watched the reaction as the interpretation came in. Uh, there was stunned silence. From thenceforth, the effort and focus and attitude in subsequent practices at the dojo was of the highest level. So needless to say, I've never forgotten that episode. It really underlines what the true attitude and spirit of Japanese Budo should be. Here is an acclaimed Budo superstar, a 10th done in Aikido, a master of Katori Shintoryu, a man sought out by director Akito Kurosawa because Kurosawa wanted the best sword master to, to choreograph his fight scenes, but also a master who understood intuitively what would work best on the film. Which is not easy because sometimes a, a lot of sword masters they have no understanding of film, so they don't know what you know works with angles and stuff like that. Anyways, a man who was a direct pupil of both Morihei Ueshiba, the founder of Aikido, and Jigoro Kano, the founder of Judo, and at almost ninety years old, studying for seventy years and teaching for fifty years, still thinking of himself as a beginner. Wow, there are no words to express how it made me feel. They say that great leaders lead by example. Well, I was glad and I feel extremely blessed that I was fortunate enough to be there to see this great example of true Buddha spirit and actually one of life's special moments. So that's an interesting story. True story. Yeah. And here's another story. When I interviewed Kajitsu Sensei in 2008 about what he thought was important for students to remember when studying Kenjutsu, he remarked, I would like my students to remember that everyone is the same. There is no student, there is no teacher. Wow, how very interesting. I found this idea very unique and a little difficult to understand, so I, I asked him what he meant. And he said, Budo is like climbing a mountain. Everyone is climbing up the same mountain. I'm just farther up the mountain than you. I have seen the path that you will take. So I can point out some of the pitfalls that I have already encountered on my journey up this mountain. However, you must realize that I am still myself going up this mountain. But I am not a guide telling you where you should go. We are all mountain climbers in the same group. But there are naturally some of us with more experience than the rest of the group. So, whoa. I was truly astounded when I heard this, and um, I was interviewing him, even. I've met many teachers before, and I had never heard that before. It was unique and deep and insightful. So now you know why I had to follow him. He was a true philosopher. I knew it was destiny that I would have a lot to learn from this teacher. Remember, it's all about the relationship between teacher and student. That is the only important thing in Buddha training. So what can we learn from that great interview? One cultural idea is groupness. The Japanese embrace the idea of the group, working for the betterment of the group, and the striving for harmony within the group. For example, you, you know the story of Japanese uh, salarymen or businessmen, they work like crazy for their companies. They work for the group. And that contrasts a little with the Western idea of individuality, where you kind of work for yourself. And in some cases, we can see there is no harmony in, in this approach. So that's one cultural issue that's very different between our cultures and societies. 
Back to the question of rank. Rank can, in the minds of some people, put stress on individual accomplishments, which can lead to uh, personal aggrandizement, like ego. How did I do? Where am I on the ladder? How did I, how do I get to the next rung? Well, it is what it is, and I see the need for it, but in some cases, this goal-driven obsession, you know, if it's unchecked, can lead to other forms of negative behavior, such as an excessive focus on competition, which reveals itself in behaviors like, we say, keeping up with the Joneses. In other words, keeping up with your peers. So it's, it's a form of competition. Competition deals with victory and defeat, like modern sports, which to the old school Budo people, completely contradicts true Budo spirit, what they call Shinbu, which is based more on cooperation, and that's the idea of harmony, or wa in Japanese, than competition. And all this has to do with, you know, what is the real purpose of Budo? Anyway, in, in my organization, we, we do not have ranks. We have study group leaders, but it is more of an administrative role and position. It's your turn to teach and pass it on, administer your group and make sure it grows properly. So this mountain climbing idea, which I have adopted from Kajitsuka Sensei, focuses on having more experienced people guiding the less experienced people, which is basically, in not so many words, the old Japanese senpai kohai system. And of course, we all work together, you know, so that's what we encourage. With rank can come an idea into some people's heads that they are better than others. This is the idea of competition again. I'm better than you, I have a higher rank than you, and from the lower ranks of these big, big organizations, I have heard from the lower ranks that some of them feel this way at the big seminars because it is like a caste system. You know, the higher ranks stay over here, the lower ranks stay over there, and never shall the two groups meet. So automatically, there is a sense of division and exclusion. I realize from an administrative standpoint, that this is perhaps necessary for efficiency because you have so many people, right? But in some cases, it is detrimental to a sense of group cohesion. So some lower level students may start thinking, well, I can't wait to get up there so I can start giving the orders, or I wanna join that group because it looks so much more interesting. I wanna be in that special group, so, you know, and things like that. So I, I've seen it here in Canada. I've seen it also in Japan. And, oh, let, let me take just an aside here to clear one thing up. And uh, I hope our listeners will, will not take this the wrong way. I don't mean to paint all Westerners with one brush. Remember, it's case by case. We have some really great practitioners and some really great people here in the West. And we have some who are not so good. I'm um, speaking about character and personality. And I have seen some not so good people in Japan. And I've met some really great people there too. So please don't get the wrong idea about what I say. Um, but in discussing cultural differences and expectations, I find that more education is needed here because we're not raised with that cultural background about Japanese ideals. Uh, these aren't Canadian ideals or North American ideals, and they aren't part of the natural fiber of our socialization and upbringing here in North America. So naturally, we will find a larger number of people here who have no idea about what real Japanese Budo ideally should be like and look like. Anyways, here's another story that will illustrate that. It comes from a friend who is an instructor of kendo from Japan. She was a three-time consecutive undefeated champion of the Tri-County High School Kendo Championship in her region, which is the northern part of Akita Prefecture. She served as a captain of the kendo team for many years, known in Japanese as Senpo. And I have to relate this story to you, her story, because it is a great story. And it really epitomizes this difference in culture and why culture is important in Budo training. So I'll just read the interview I had with her. So, <clears throat> question. Did you look into other kendo dojos near where you live? Matsuhashi. Yes, I did. Well, I looked into one kendo dojo or one kendo club near my house first. However, I did not like the impression I got from the instructors. Question. What happened, if you don't mind my asking? Matsuhashi. They were sort of looking down on me with an elegant attitude. That bothered me. But what bothered me much more is when they quickly changed their attitude toward me. As soon as I told them I am from Japan, 
I was trained in Japan, and I have a third Don from Japan. These three points changed their impression of me significantly. I could not believe this. There were other visitors there at the same time as myself, and one of the instructors treated one other visitor with the attitude like, you are below me. There was no respect. Question, can you give us more details of what happened? Matsuhashi. Well, when I arrived at the dojo, I approached one Caucasian guy first to see if they were still accepting beginners. He said no, and pretended like he was too busy to talk to me. After a while, I again asked him if I could watch for a while. He said curtly, I suppose so, but stay at the back as much as possible. I observed him bowing and greeting very nicely to the older senseis as they arrived, who were Japanese and Asians. I decided to approach to one older Japanese man who had a Japanese tare, which is that, I guess, the nameplate on front of the, it's the, the, the apron, right? Because I thought he might be a person with a higher position in that club and hopefully could give me some better information. He was very polite and kind. He advised me to talk to a Korean fellow who was one of the instructors. He was standing with the Caucasian man who I had just talked to. The Korean man was polite and asked me general information like if I have a bogu to use. Bogu is the armor. Uh, did I have any experience in kendo? And which don, if any, I had? So through the conversation, they found out that, found out that I am originally from Japan, that I was trained in kendo in Japan, and that I passed Shodan Shiken in Japan. At this very moment, the, this Caucasian man said, oh, why didn't you say so? I could not believe how much his attitude changed in a second. As we were talking, one university student came up to him, a Caucasian student, and asked if there were any openings in the beginner's class. Of course, he was choppy and gave him very minimal information and tried to get back in conversation with me by saying, so did you bring your bogu? I have to learn some of your techniques from you. It made me feel sick to my stomach. I watched him practice kendo with the others. He was trying to show off and show how much better he was than everyone else. I'm sure he has a higher don than me and maybe with a title in this club, but this was not true Japanese Budo spirit. It was very sad. Question, so in your opinion, what values are important to learn through the study of kendo? Okay, so yeah, so just think about my question. So in your opinion, what values were important to learn through the study of Kendo? Matsuhashi, modesty, patience, and quiet wisdom. These might not be noticeable immediately, but I think these are very important. Your true character is reflected in your attitude. Wow, a great story. So right here, we see what culture in Japanese Budo looks like and the cultural differences between East and West in their approach to Budo. For some Westerners, it is about techniques because they do not have that cultural backdrop, backdrop that is present in Japan. But when they leave the dojo, it's back to their Canadian or American life with its ideas of individuality, my rights, my right to free speech, my right to express myself, etc. I come first. Modesty, patience, and quiet wisdom. Yes, they're universal values, but in this case, in, in Japanese Budo, they are vestiges of the Tokugawa reign. That's, that's Japanese culture. You belong to a group, you think of the group, the group comes first. So of course, that Westerner is going to try to steal her techniques. It's all about him, what he can gain. Does he really care about modesty, patience, quiet wisdom? No. He's, he's aggressive. You know, Budo is something to be acquired and taken. He's very direct. You know, in Japan, things are not done directly. That's too disrespectful. It's too rude and it's a little arrogant. So there's another cultural difference. So if we think about the higher purpose of Kendo, um, since we're talking about Kendo, or any Japanese sword study, it is not to kill as many opponents as possible so that you can be the best around. Uh, you don't need much training to do that. That's what this guy was trying to show off, how dominant he was. And, and that's arrogance. Uh, on the other hand, my master, Kajitsuka Sensei, said that the higher purpose of sword study, the way of the sword, or uh, ken no michi, or sometimes ken do, not kendo the fencing, but um, the principle of kendo, uh, principle of the sword, was for old time warriors the way to grow a soul. 
<clears throat> Indeed, Yagyu Sekishusai, the second headmaster of Shinkagedu, wrote a treatise in 1601 called Heho Hyakushu, A Hundred Poems on the Art of War. In poem 91, he said, the secret principle of Heho is being gentle, kind, courteous, modest, and deferential. And this is from a guy who fought on the battlefields in the Warring States period killed other soldiers and was almost killed himself. Uh, he was wounded by an arrow. His first son fought with him and became a cripple for life. Sekishusai was a war veteran, and I guess you could call him a tough guy. And is it interesting that what he thought was super important in life and in Budo is to be gentle, kind, courteous, modest, and deferential? Wow. So. This is the idea of humility in Buddha. Why do I harp on it so much? Because it is a key feature of the Japanese Buddha mindset. And the Japanese Buddha mindset comes from Zen. So for our practice of Japanese Buddha, what aspects of Zen culture do we need to know? Since we're not Buddhists, or we don't practice Buddhism, or might not practice Buddhism. Well, Yagyu Koichi Sensei said that we must let go of our ego. That, that is Zen too. So. That's a good place to start. Your ego clouds your mind, he said. That is the basis of the idea of kachijinken, the, the living sword or the life-giving sword. So in a fight, we must be able to see clearly. That requires an open mind. Remember, we talked about open mind. Free from ego and preconceptions. Actually, this also applies to your don testing in the idol. In high pressure situations, you, if you get fixated or obsessed, you will lose. Or I guess in your case, you'll screw up. But back to what I was saying, with an open mind, you can be creative and not constrained. You can be free, free to adapt, to flow with the moment. And for some people, this is scary. People become afraid. With freedom, there is no structure. My ego depends on having that structure there to bolster my sense of self-worth. That's why trying something new, going in a new direction, throwing everything away is so difficult for people. You need to be willing to step out that door. The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, the thousand mile journey begins with one step. And he is so right. So the first step, the leap of faith we talked about. So in all, Japanese martial arts is completely infused with Japanese culture. It is their heritage. Budo is an integral part of their tradition, their social customs and thinking. It's an important piece of their history and traditions. So yes, culture is in Budo. A martial, bringing it back to martial arts style, a martial arts style is an expression of its founders' wishes, hopes, and ideas. The techniques are just a manifestation of those wishes and ideas. Kajisa Sensei said that through continued practice, Hopefully, we can wrap ourselves in and come to understand the spirit, the mind, and the hopes of the founder. That is the culture of the style. And I guess I can understand that. Like, why do we study a martial art? I suppose we, study, we start initially in order to address a need, like needing greater self-confidence, to learn self-defense methods, to feel more secure, not to get beaten up, uh, and, and things like that. But as I have gotten deeper and deeper in my study of these styles and arts, I have found increasingly that it is to understand the spirit, mind, and hopes of those founders. This is what I now find really fascinating. It's not so much the te techniques anymore, it's the culture. I guess I have enough techniques. You know, you study long enough, you see a lot, a lot of techniques, and they are all pretty, pretty similar. So I hope from this entire talk that people will take away that Japanese Budo is very rich in its depths. It's not just techniques. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of this. And it's, it's so great to hear from someone that has depth of experience and depth of thinking in these topics. Like you, you can have people that have been around the martial arts for a long time and all they do is the technical part of the practice and they haven't thought more deeply about where it comes from 
and how do I understand why I'm doing this more deeply? And it can, it's clear here that not only have you gained from your own research, but in talking to your senseis who themselves have a lot of deep thinking in this subject matter, that you can gain a lot of lessons. And thank you for sharing all of these lessons with all of us today. But, you know, my, my master, Kajisa Sensei, he, don't forget, he is the Secretary General of the Nihon Kobudo Shinkokai, which is a huge Kobudo Koryu organization in Japan, the, the biggest one, actually. And they have 800 members and like 77 duha. So that's 77 headmasters, or sokes. And he's talking to all of them. So, you know, obviously they exchange ideas and they learn from each other and, and probably share a lot of similar ideas, you know, about Japanese Budo. So in that way, if you're in martial arts long enough, yeah, you learn a lot of things just, just by meeting people and, and uh, discussing things with them and um, sharing ideas. Yeah. yeah. What, what I feel like I've gained so much from these three interviews is that we, we all became attracted to these, the Japanese martial arts for one, one reason or another. And it has more to do with something beyond than just the technique itself, because we could learn fighting techniques from other origins as well. But there's something that drew us here, and it's probably the Japanese culture, but we didn't realize that so much of it is either embedded in the art itself, like you're saying, the, the founder came from a certain place, and they created these techniques based on that understanding and from that foundation. And in exploring these different cultural, cultural aspects more, more deeply, it, we can gain a better understanding of the arts themselves. And you've shared a lot of sources for which we can find like the different religions, even modern ideals inside Japanese culture that we can uh, explore. So thank you. Sure. And here, here's a little tidbit. Did you know, you study Muso, Jigiden, Eishin, do you? Yes. If you look up their history, I think, was it the seventh guy or somewhere along the line, there was a Shinkage-ryu practitioner. Oh, really? Ha, you should look oh. that up. <laughs> so we would think that like he has influenced the art a little bit well he's be. been in there somewhere <laughs> yeah. anyway so that's what i mean by you know japanese budo is they kind of influence each other right eh? mm -hmm. great so thank but you anyways, so much. Thank, thank you patrick for having me i, I really enjoyed doing a series of podcasts with you Hopefully we can do more other ones if, if you're interested in the future. There's lots of stuff to talk about. But I, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to share my ideas and uh, to talk to your listeners. So thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you so much. All right, we'll talk again soon. Okay. Okay, have a great day. All right, thanks. Talk Patrick. to you later. Thank you. Okay. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode because we have a lot more exciting interviews and resources to help you explore the world of martial arts. To get the latest on what we're up to at Tokushikai Canada, subscribe to our newsletter at subscribe.tokushikai.ca and find us on Facebook and Instagram at tokushikai.canada. Until next time, thanks for listening.